dulce-based truth and evidence. We have a wonderful show lined up for you tonight, and thank you so much for joining me. I'm very Thanks, excited. And, <laughs> and here we are. And so uh, Greg Valdez is has been investigating the Dulce base for years, along with uh, his father. And he has a history in law enforcement, not only just investing, investigating cattle mutilations, uh, but also investigating other stranger things. And Greg, DEA, did I hear that right? Yes, that's correct. I'm retired so <laughs> from well, that's DEA. A good, that's a good thing. Could you tell folks a little bit about um, your background and sort of give, give folks a, a bit of a framework for how you got into looking into the things in the ad paranormal? Well, since we grew up, I obviously grew up in Dulce. My dad was stationed in Dulce with the New Mexico State Police. Um, he was the only state police officer. He's not a tribal member, but he was stationed on the Native American reservation there. So he got involved in this mystery back in the 1976 with the cattle mutilations, which some of the older people probably remember. A lot of the younger kids don't know too much about it, but they had a lot of these cattle mutilations in the Dulce area in northern New Mexico. So kind of by default, he became one of the experts in the cattle mutilation investigations. And that later evolved into the Dulce Bay stories, uh, Paul Benowitz, and some of the stuff we'll probably go over tonight. Um, so, of course, I was with him the whole time when I go patrolling with him. I later became a state police officer um, before I became a DEA um, employee. So I've been in law enforcement. I followed him because even back then it was very interesting stuff as this stuff was developing. It went from the cattle to the lights to the whole Paul Benowitz story, and it's just kind of grown and grown since then. And when my dad retired from the state police, he stayed um, active and involved in a lot of these mysteries. And of course, I still continued um, helping him or working with him. And as as he grew older, and I got older also, so that's kind of the background of where this all started from. Okay. And how young were you when you first started riding along with your dad, looking at all this this kind of stuff? Four years old. <laughs> wow, they got you young, man. <laughs> yeah, well, there's not much else to do up in Dulce. It's there's it's a small town, and you know, of course, this day and age, you can't do that with law enforcement. But this was back in the seventies, and you know, I was I was lucky. I was able to um, ride around with him, and um, some of the photos actually he had a they had a photographer from Time Life photo take some pictures of him, and I'm in the background <laughs> when I was a kid with a dead cow in the forefront. You know, wow. <laughs> It's been one of those things, and like I said, it's always been interesting. And one one of the unique things about Dulce is, you know, all these top investigators that have been invest in the UFO field for years, whether they're good, bad, or whatever the case, people can decide that on their own. Most of them have been at Dulce at one time or another to talk to my dad. So you go back the the Linda Howes, the Bill Moores, you name it. Most of them have been up at Dulce at one time or another. So it's uh, an interesting perspective that my dad had because we were able to kind of get all these different pieces of the puzzle. And then a year, you have to also include the law enforcement contacts he had um, when he was dealing with the, the mutilations. And it's just, it's a very long story and we'll try to cover as much as we can tonight, but um, hopefully that's a little bit of a background for you. I think I thank you. And I think that that's one thing that really separates you and, and the work of your father from a lot of the other investigators. It's like you and your dad were really the, the sort of linchpin for investigating the area. Y'all live there. One of the concerns that I've always had in beginning to question the popular narrative and ufology with the alien Dulce base with the reptilians down at Nightmare Hall is that people are not looking at actual credible investigators. They're looking at stories rather than evidence. And as I understand it, in looking through your your excellent book uh, that, that's available on Amazon, Dulce Based the Truth and Evidence from the Case Files of Gabe Valdez, y you actually have written this book based on real hardcore evidence. Yes, um, um, for people that don't realize or or know, my dad passed away in 2011. So when he passed away, I ended up with all his his files, and uh, I didn't want to throw them away because there's a lot of valuable information. So after he passed away, a lot of these investigators that have been around for years, they were still contacting me 
trying to get um, a lot of his documents, information, or, or whatever the case. So instead of trying to explain it email by email by email, uh, it was just easier to write a book and kind of organize it because the book, it explains how the story developed. Um, it's not always glamorous. For some people, it's boring. But if you want to know how the Dulce legend started, the book goes step by step and it tells you, well, good, bad and ugly, how the story started and some of the characters that came into the story whether they were credible or, or not credible or whatever the case. And uh, so the book is just to outline my dad's involvement in the in the story because he was one of the central figures for people that are very familiar with it. Um, of course, Paul Benowitz is a big piece of the puzzle also. But um, if you look on the internet, a lot of the stuff on the internet is false. And um, it, it was getting kind of frustrating when people would argue with me. And I was like, well, we live there. I know I can show you the documents of what happened in you know scenario x y z and a lot of people would still argue it was like well you know that's false right and they would say no it's not false and i was like well i can show you why it's false they looked at that 30 years ago 20 years ago whatever the, the case and it's been um, either proved correct or incorrect or whatever so um, it's just more to set the story straight on what really happened I think that's a great way to approach it because having those kinds of case files as well as your own personal experiences, like you kind of have the best of both worlds. Not only were you there, not only was your father there, but also he was, he at the time, if, if I'm, please do correct me if I'm off base, he was actually working on duty during these investigations. Yes, you're correct. Yeah. And you know, what's unique about, like I mentioned earlier, where he got involved in all this, um, this mystery was through the cow emulations and you know this day and age you know i worked with a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies if they get they still get uh, calls of cow emulations or animal emulations most police officers will go out there and just say it's a dead animal write a quick report and let's go eat or whatever the case mm -hmm. but my dad was taking physical evidence he got a scientist from sandia national labs from the very first mutilation to start documenting the strange activities that were going on. And that's what really helped him because he didn't just, you know, take it as another call. And that's the way he did his law enforcement career. He took his job very serious. This is back, you know, several decades. Um, he cared about people and he's one of the old fashioned police officers where he wanted to help you out. He wasn't there to arrest you or give you a hard time. He truly tried to help these ranchers because the ranchers were being affected. And of course, the story developed on into the, the Dulce story, but um, that kind of gives you a, a baseline of how he did things. He was very um, passionate and um, even OCD to a point where he just kept researching stuff and documenting evidence. And that comes from the law enforcement training, which is good because that's what they're supposed to do and stay neutral and let the evidence take you where it goes and not make predetermined um, conclusions. And that's probably what helped him the most is that law enforcement training. And I use the same um, rationale, follow the evidence and it'll tell you um, what's going on. And it's, it's the same for a murder case, a rape case, you know, in, in this case, dead cows, which led into other things and into this UFO mystery. And one of the things that I've really been kind of a stickler on in the investigative work that myself and my team are doing is is sort of the phrase show me your evidence like the claims are great but let's let's show me the evidence follow the data and then follow the logic that comes from that um if you could take us back into the very beginning of the legend of the the dulce base in terms of what the reality is that that y'all found out versus what the stories are because i think this is kind of a crux point in the overall field of ufology and the paranormal to compare and contrast, like what, what's the story versus what's the reality from the evidence standpoint? Um, I'll, I'll try to do a, a summary. It's going to be a fairly long summary, but I'll, try okay. to I'll, I'll jump into Go ahead. <laughs> so the gist of the story is my dad was involved with these cattle mutilations, like I mentioned. So they set up a conference in Albuquerque and, in the 80s so my dad's one of the guest speakers at this meeting he talks about the lights that they've been seeing or we've been seeing up in Dulce a lot of people have been seeing these unidentified lights 
So Paul Benowitz comes to him after the conference and says, hey, I've been seeing those same lights down here at, um, in Albuquerque at Curlin Air Force Base. So I'd like to talk to you. So that's how they developed their relationship. So that, of course, that piqued my dad's interest because he had no expo explanation for the lights at the time. The cattle was, a, that's another story and that's kind of a whole nother episode here, but. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this we gets fairly go. twisted, right? I mean, it does get fairly yeah. twisted together. You can go down a lot of rabbit holes, so I'll try to keep it on point here. So anyway, he talks to my dad and says, I have these videos of these lights going in and out of the Curlin Air Force Base in Albuquerque. So my dad, uh, he goes up to Dulce, makes some trips up there, and it's a very, very long story. So Paul eventually goes to the Air Force and says, hey, you guys have a problem. You have these uh, aircraft going into Kirtland. Of course, rewind back to the time frame. This is 1980s. There's no internet. There's no uh, email. You know, it's phone calls and snail mail. Right. And the old person going to a library to actually do research. So Paul was doing a ton of research. And when he goes to the Air Force, of course, this stuff's been declassified in Keep in mind, at the time, we didn't know all this stuff was going on. A lot of it's been declassified since then. The Air Force starts monitoring him and tracking him. So what he ended up st stumbling onto is one of their top secret projects down at Curlin Air Force Base. This is during the Star Wars era where they were doing a lot of laser research. Mm. And of course, once again, we didn't know about it. And if you look at the history of, of Curlin, the research they do here, they, there's a lot of space uh, directorate that uh, occurs the state space director program is based most of it's based out of albuquerque okay. or a large part um so they do a lot of space research here at kirtland so uh special agent richard Doty gets involved with air force intelligence they start actually working him to see what information because they're interested in the films he's been taking and this is another long part of the story but there's a lot of details i'm skipping over mm -hmm. so Doty tells him through the Air Force and some other agencies, that there's an underground alien base up in Dulce because they're trying to distract him from what's really going on at Curlin. It's the project that he stumbled on and the oh. fact that he's videotaping all this stuff. And to top it off, like Paul was, is kind of interesting. Him and my dad were similar. They were somewhat both OCD. So Paul would get, sit on his rooftop at night and film these lights going in and out of the base, but it'd be like 20 degrees outside in the, you know, in January. Oh, man. One, two in the morning when, you know, they thought they were safe to do these projects because everyone's usually sleeping or no one pays attention to it. But Paul was just obsessed enough to where he would monitor and videotape all this stuff. So he was collecting a, a large amount of uh, valuable information. So through this, Richard Doty and starts communicating with Paul. He starts giving Paul information. So Paul will go up to Dulce and talk to my dad and say, hey, there's a base here. Um, where the story really starts is he said they crashed a nuclear-powered alien ship as well. This, the story initially started. And that came from Doty originally? No. Yeah, well, now we know that. We didn't know that at the time. Okay. So at the time, so this is what would happen. Paul would just show up and he'd say, Hey, you have this stuff going up here in Dulce and you're literally in your backyard. So he'd show it to my dad and some of the information was correct, but some of it was false. But about 80% of the information that Paul was giving was accurate. And he had photographs, he had maps. So basically what Richard Doty was giving him, about 80% of it was classified information that he probably shouldn't have been giving it to him. Yeah. But to sell, to sell the story that they were trying to convince him of, they had to give him partial truths. So like now when you go back, um, basically I tell people, if you look at a lot of the, the Richard Doty stuff, the Paul Benowitz stuff, if you eliminate the alien part of the story, you basically can get a very clear picture of what was really going on, on up at Dulce. And they were testing a lot of military aircraft is the gist of it. <laughs> I call it like an Area 52. Right. Um, and there's more to that story and how we figured that out because there's evidence. We found evidence of it. It's not like we're just making it up, you know. Well, there, there was a crash that. Now, did you and your father investigate some crash out there? Yes, but just to make sure it wasn't an alien aircraft. So Paul comes up and says they crashed this whatever he was calling it an alien ship. When was that so, crash, Greg? Do you remember? 
Uh, I believe 83. Okay. And was it a big object? Yes, because we found the crash site. Wow. Tell us about it. So Paul comes with once again with these photos, and um, this is rugged country. You're at nine, ten thousand feet, and it's basically on the Colorado New Mexico border. For people that are familiar with it, so um, this is hiking country. So you know, I'm a wildland firefighter, so I've hiked some rough mountains, and <laughs> yeah, that's what I do in my my retirement job. So well, thank this you is for rugged, that, especially with the with the fires going out there out west. Thank you for continuing to do that for us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but uh, like, as far as country is concerned, this is very rugged country. So it's not like you can drive in there. Um, you have, it's mostly walking and it's basically a needle in a haystack. So and Paul comes with these photos and he says, look, the aircraft hit this tree, flew over this mountain, hit this tree, landed here. Here's the crash site. And surprisingly, we walked right to it and we found exactly where he hit and the trees um, the photos are in the book. You can see where I know enough about trees because I'm out in the woods all the time with yeah, forestry type stuff. Yeah, you know, too. something broke that, tr something hit the tree. It wasn't lightning. I know what lightning looks like. Um, you know, something hit it, it broke it a certain way, it hit the second tree. And sure enough, um, there was a, a crater where uh, something had crashed. And um, Edmund Gomez, who was the son of the rancher that was um, getting hit with all the mutilations, you know, he found a, a, a government pin. Someone had dropped a pin. He actually said U.S. government on it. So they went and cleaned up the crash. They, they did clean up the crash site and they took it out the north end through the Colorado side um, because of the roads. And that's a, another story. But um, anyway, they did take it out the north end of the, of the mountain, which is Mount Archuleta. So... We were going up there doing all these um, expeditions up there to go look for this base. So, and like I s mentioned earlier, some of the information was accurate that Paul was giving, but then some of it would go on the left field and it'd come to a dead end. And my dad was OCD enough. He would research all these stories. So whether he'd confirm if they were either yes, no, or undecided, we'll figure this out later. Of course, as time went on, some of the undecided stuff kind of came into play. Um, as the years passed and stuff was declassified but at the time they didn't know what was going on it was a mystery you know and it was pretty kind of hair raising because they did find uh, the wire taps in our our house um, we found the phone taps manuel gomez who was the rancher getting hit with a lot of the cattle mutilations they found the the wire tap in um, his phone in his residence and keep in mind they didn't do search warrants this is <laughs> wow they just went right yeah. in didn't they yeah and like you know, with us, my dad was a police officer. We never locked the doors in dual C or we leave the keys in the ignition. It's a small, it was a small town, you know, but Manuel used to lock his doors. And so it was a professional job and without straying too much from the story here. So there was a lot of, a lot of things going on up there for a small little town and a lot of interesting, um, you know, my dad knew that <laughs> um, it's something to take serious in the, Paul was on to something, whatever, wherever he was getting his information from. And we found out later it was Richard Doty, but um, and part of it was true and just part of it was false. And as the story developed, um, other stories emerged out of it. Um, there's Phil Schneider, uh, Thomas Costello, some of these other stories. Uh, John Lear kind of comes into the picture. He was up in Dulce quite a bit. We um, met him several times. And then the story just kind of splinter off from there, depending on which internet site you look at or yeah, who you talk to it, it's absolutely and thank you for detailing that it's absolutely amazing how one place can have so many different things happening allegedly at the same time what's your take on the phil schneider components of the the dulce bay story my dad like i mentioned earlier he looked into every detail of all these different stories not just his but other ones like thomas costello Phil's uh, story never panned out. So first of all, and it, this for people that are somewhat familiar with the story, to make it easier, all the stories that from Dulce that never quite panned out or are that are not legitimate come from John Lear. That's the simple way of of putting it. Okay. So Schneider was involved with John Lear. Schneider didn't come into the picture till later. All these stories with Paul started in the early eighties. And I believe Phil started popping up in like 88, 1990, around that time frame. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So he wasn't producing anything that was new. He was rehashing a lot of stuff that had already been put out by investigators. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the law enforcement kind of trick where they don't always release all the details of the investigation to the public. They'll keep some of it hidden so that that way if someone does come forward and they know specifics, it's a way of verifying if the person is telling the truth or not. It's a quick and easy way. Uh, it's a little investigative trick that a lot of law enforcement agents use. Right. Um, they were using that back in the in the day. My dad wasn't releasing a lot of little stuff. It wasn't really important, but it was enough to verify if the people knew what they were talking about. And one of those little key things is, I kind of mentioned it earlier, this crash site was at Mount Archuleta. Now the main mountain when you go into Dulce is Archuleta Mesa, two different places, two different things. So it was a quick and easy way to kind of differentiate who was legitimate and kind of who knew what was going on or if they're really providing accurate information. Oh, so it, so the so where the crash site was was actually up near the Colorado border. Yes, and it's fairly it's, far it's away. Very, it's deceptive. So you either have to be a local, and even some of the locals get confused about it, or you have to be part of the story to know the difference between the two. So Paul obviously knew, he was very adamant in Mount Archuleta. My dad, a few other people that were involved in it. So that was a good way to filter all this stuff out. So a lot of Phil's stuff when he was first coming out was Archuleta Mesa, and then he would talk to Lear, and then it switched to Mount Archuleta. So just little things like that is kind of what they would look at. when, Because like I said, any and everybody was coming up to Dulce. To, they're either doing news stories or writing a book or whatever the case, um, or a lot of these investigators would come up. So with F- Phil's story, if we want to stick on that one, this topic for a, a few minutes. Sure. His ex-wife, Cynthia Dreyer, or Dreyer, I don't know how to pronounce her last name. We'll just call her Cynthia. Mm-hmm. She started corresponding with my dad. So she's sending him a ton of this information in Dulce. So he starts investigating it. Obviously, there's the suicide and all the different things. So my dad looked into it. All of Phil's stories never panned out. They always came to a dead end. Um, Phil's brother was a deputy with, the, I believe, Clackamas County Sheriff's Department. He talked to Phil's brother. And like his brother said, no, my brother did not commit suicide. Um, there was a lot of rumors that documents were falsified. The coroner's office was falsified, uh, falsifying documents. That never panned out. That wasn't true. What was true is they did a very sloppy investigation, the law enforcement investigation, when they found the body, obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's what creates more of a headache. But the information, and this is key to it, the information that Phil put out in a lot of his lectures that he was involved in a firefight in 1977 or whatever year, an underground, underground firefight. This is also the same story that Thomas Costello has put out, if you're familiar with that. Yeah, I was going to ask you about Costello too, but yeah, we can, we can drill down on both of them. Yeah. The firefight story. So let me back up and I have documents here in the house, the firefight story, underground alien firefight story was started by Richard Doty. I have documents where he told that to Paul, Paul has it documented. So this comes from the Air Force, and it's one of the things that Doty fabricated. So um, I mentioned earlier where it's a good gauge if you know a, a, a detail about part of the case that other people may or may not know. What became a marker for investigators, if someone came and said they were part of the 77 firefight or alien firefight, they knew that they weren't providing accurate information because they found out later that this was coming from the Air Force. It was a false story. Does that make sense? It absolutely does. And and on that point uh, w- with Phil Schneider too, we my team has just got Freedom of Information Act from the FBI on Phil Schneider's file. And apparently he had a little bit of a history of mental illness, um, self-mutilation, uh, as well as actually buying radioactive material and storing it under his bed and yes. you've heard about that yeah we knew about that since the 70s 80s of well, course the, you did <laughs> the 80s when they were looking into like i said my dad he he was ocd so he looked into it and he, he took it with a grain of salt um cynthia was asking for money she was more trying to hustle money out of his story um, people do whatever they got to do no judgment there don't really care about that but 
um, you do see that in some of these investigations. What's their ultimate goal? Um, they're trying to get money. It is what it is. That was kind of her angle when she became part of the involved with my dad or trying to get stuff from my dad. He helped her as much as he could, but um, that story fizzled out. So now let's change gears a little bit. So there's a lot of things. Uh, Phil's mental health, um, like they looked into all that. So let's go back to the firefight story. And we're kind of bleeding into Thomas Costello now. Okay. And, so then, the, and for folks out there listening, the firefight story is that there was an alien, human, and black beret shootout underground. And it kind of goes in different directions from there. And where that story originated was from John Lear. And there's some a lot of history, but John Lear is the one that started that story through Cherry Hinkle, Tal Levesque. Um, they were out in Las Vegas, Nevada. So anyway, this this other additional side story comes out after Doty had told Paul about the underground firefight. Coincidentally enough, this Thomas Costello was supposedly involved in the same. He was supposed to be a security guard at Los Alamos Labs. Um, they kidnapped his kids, his wife, and killed him. There's some stories that say they killed him. Some said he vanished to South America. There's a, a wide variety of it's a urban legend. So <laughs> take it with a grain of salt. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but he, was, Tal, he was a real guy. I mean, he was a real person. That's what they claim. So okay. you know, now I'll get into this now. Okay. A bit. So Tal Levesque and John Lear were putting this story out in the 70s. So according to Tal, he used to live next to, um, to Thomas Costello in Santa Fe, and they'd commute up to Los Alamos Labs and all this stuff. So my dad did the record search. He's like, well, give me the address you lived in in, in um, Santa Fe, and I'll find... You're, he's your neighbor. I'll be able to find him pretty easy. Do you think that ever panned out? So, but that's the kind of detail my dad went into. And it's simple stuff, but it's very time consuming. It's boring, but it gives you a ton of information. So he looked into all that stuff with Thomas Costello. Thomas Costello was a dead end. Um, so get back to the firefight. So if 77 people die in one day, according to the legend or whatever the case. So if, let's just say they have a mom and dad. So that's two people that are going to be missing a relative. If they're married, that's three people. If they have kids, you know, you can do the math. 77, let's just multiply that by two. You're getting three. You're getting up to two, 300 people that have missing relatives on the one day. Good point. My dad, my dad researched all of this. He backtracked government employees, people missing. You know, it's hard to make that many people just vanish in the wind without relatives looking for them. Right. Same thing with Thomas Costello. So my dad tracked down Thomas Costello. Well, if his kids were kidnapped, where did they go to school? We'll go talk to the friends of the, the kid. Hmm. Does that make sense? It sure does. Well, who who was his wife involved in? That's how law enforcement investigations. And that fizzled out quick. So my dad knew that was a false story. It's a cover story is all it is. A distraction. Of course, we know that now. We didn't know that back at the time. And it, it wasted a lot of time. My dad was dealing with this. He was getting other law enforcement involved in the Santa Fe area. Wow. So he's chasing rabbits while they're doing whatever they're doing to the cows or Paul Benowitz or whatever the case. So mm. it's just, it's, it's part of the, whether it's good or bad, it's part of the story that developed and it is what it is, you know? Yeah. But that's what I try to tell people. If you want to believe it, great. Um, that's up to you. Uh, John Lear's the one that provided all the Dulce papers, the infamous seven levels. Um, Thomas Costello supposedly took this video and that he gave commands that if he didn't show up in X amount of years that they were supposed to release those videos to the public. Well, those have never been released. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he's supposedly dead. And, you know, it just it fizzles out. And I'm not trying to be biased. I'm just telling you. I wasted a lot of time on it. My dad spent a lot of time on it. People that are listening are feel free to investigate it, but it's going to take you down the same path everywhere you go. And that's what some of this min misinformation is designed. It's designed to take you so you either waste time or you're looking in the wrong direction when others, they're doing stuff behind you. It's kind of like a magician's trick. Watch my right hand while my left hand's doing what it needs to do or the actual trick, you know. If, if that makes sense. No, it makes a lot of sense. This kind of misdirection, if things were all started by, you know, the Air Force, 
tr through Doty and others trying to get people away from where th the action was really going on, then of course there would be some benefit to continuing the myth and continuing the, the sort of the false narrative. Yes, and when, you know, like I mentioned, when people come to Dulce, we've heard a, a lot of different things over the, you know, this has been, we're going on 40, 50 years of this story already, including the mutilations and sometimes even longer in some of these other investigations. If people are going to make these claims, I have the perspective, it's up to you to prove it. If you're going to come and tell me a story, um, it's kind of on them to prove, like, let's go back to Phil. He said he had his ID from the government, but he mailed it back. Well, that's a pretty good way of proving you worked for the military or whatever story is floating around. So why would you mail that back if that's your one piece of evidence that verifies <laughs> um, you, you know, the claims you're making? Another thing my dad looked into was his social security because he claimed he had two social securities or Cynthia, his ex-wife, well, actually claimed it. Right. So we pulled all the social security files and of course that was time consuming. So the whole time that he claimed he was working in Dulce, he was re receiving social security benefits and he was working at a shoe store in I believe Oregon or Washington or somewhere in the Northwest. So that was like a major red flag. And I have the documentation. Um, I usually use it like in presentations when I do do some presentations, but that's very clear cut. So the social security number that he was using, um, clearly shows that he did not work for the government or the military and you know i don't recommend people try to <laughs> falsify documents to social security but that's one of the things you're probably not going to have you're not going to get away with it for very long if you try it they do verify stuff you know um in that's a, another part of his story that really fell apart was his uh, social security because we pulled all that stuff and we have documents that show that the cr and, and, and that's the thing is going after the credentials. It's like going after, like you were saying earlier, the, the boring stuff of, of investigative work is actually where the real meat of, of any kind of foundation for these stories you know, exists. And we, we, we got to do the boring stuff first to make sure that it's there. Yes. And it like it is, it is time consuming, but we're lucky now because like I mentioned earlier, in this time frame, they didn't have internet. You had to go to a library yeah. or you have to mail something to somebody and you have to go actually make copies at a office or something. It's not like you have everyone has a home office or a copier. Right. So keep that in mind as you go through the story, the time frame we're talking about. We didn't have cell phones back then. Um, communication was a lot different. So how they dug up information, it was very time consuming. And now if you can at least get the gist of the story, okay, this is what happened. Dodie did this to Paul. Paul talked to so-and-so. You can go back and research. A lot of this stuff has been declassified and it is monotonous and time consuming. But if you really want it for someone that has the time to do it, you can get a very clear picture of what was going on by just tracking a lot of older documents. And it, they're all over the place. And these are legitimate documents they are coming from verified sources. But you have to know what you're looking for also. And so it means you need to know the story in detail. And exactly. It, it, it applies to other cases, whether you're into other para, if you're into paranormal stuff or Bigfoot or whatever your people are looking into, it, it takes work. And unfortunately, a lot of people just, they want to jump on the internet and see, well, what's the easiest thing? I'll, I'll click here. Yeah, that's what happened. And that's, in the Dulce story, that's not the case. A lot of the stuff on the, on the websites is, it's bogus or it's stuff that's been adding added to a false story and the person doesn't know that the story is false but they add stuff to it and it, it evolves into an urban legend which is kind of where we're at not with the dulce story and that's where we're at the uh the the website uh is it dulcebasebook.com is that down i know that you had mentioned in the book at some point that there could be some kind of interactive with being able to see some of the evidence i know how expensive it is to keep websites run believe me we got one ourselves um, is there any place where folks would be able to, to go that, that wouldn't cost a whole lot of money to be able to check out some of that evidence that you, that you had found? Well, I had it up for like four years and at first people were looking at it, but I, it was costing too much for yeah. the amount of people that were viewing it. So I just shut it off and usually people, I just communicate with them through email or whatever the case. Um, and then the, when I wrote the book, I didn't write the book. I don't, 
I'm not trying to make money. It's my dad's story. Yep. This is what happened to Dulce. So I'm not doing it uh, from a perspective of uh, I want to sell books. I could care less about selling books. Um, it's the story and it's documented in print. It'll live just like my dad. It was to honor him after he passed away. And so I'm not here to sell books. I'm not here to convince people what happened. It's just this is a story, you know, good or bad or ugly. This is how that story developed, if that makes sense to you guys. <laughs> oh, for sure. And I, you know, I think that that's uh, that's a very noble pursuit in terms of trying to get the truth out from an evidence based standpoint, because one thing that can happen in this field is, as I'm, I'm sure you're aware, is that people can kind of use somebody else's name and say, oh, well, it was Gabe Valdez that said that there was an underground base. People can can kind of be disrespectful in that way. And so I, I really do have a lot of respect for you. And, and I want to make sure that in this interview, we are getting out to the public that we really are trying to honor the good work that your father did. And we don't want to have that associated with, um, I guess, unsavory elements in these fields that may be trying to take advantage of the public in a, in a you know financial way. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate the comments and thank you for those words. And like I said, I'm, you know, I'm not here to sell books. It's just, this is a story. Um, I've been in this long enough where people have come in and it, my dad showed all his evidence to everybody. Doesn't matter who. They wanted to come see it. He it was open and that's how police officers used to do stuff, you know, they'd share with other, and I've seen it thousands of times where people will come to our house, they look at all his files, they stay there two, three days in Dulce um, at our house, and they came in with a preconceived idea that this is what it's happening, so let's make the evidence fit my theory. Mm -hmm. And my dad would, I get, I used to get more frustrated than my dad, my dad was a lot nicer than me, but <laughs> I was, <laughs> so they leave with the same or they'd either get upset because like the evidence didn't point that and they're like, well, make it fit. I was like, you don't make evidence fit. Do you want a law enforcement making evidence fit for a homicide or a, a rape? No, the evidence is, tells the story and you don't make it fit where it's convenient for you. So is, I don't get, I get upset about it anymore because a lot of people have a preconceived idea and I'm not trying to change their mind. I'm just telling you this is what happened at Dulce. Right. At least they know the story of, of how it developed and they can decide from there. It's up to them what they want to decide happened. But I'll just tell them, well, this is what we looked out or hopefully if they really want to, if they have the commitment to dig into this stuff, they don't have to waste so much time looking some down some of these rabbit holes because we've already done that for them. <laughs> right. That's what law enforcement like, does. Help them with, like, well, don't waste your time on that. Look over here or whatever the case. Um, at least they can focus to if, you know, there's legitimate researchers out there and legitimate people that are interested in, in the books to help them if they really want to, to dive into it, you know? Oh yeah. Out of the, out of the entire story, um, would you say there's one particular mystery or question that, that you wish you had the true answer to? That you just not anymore. Out, little, not anymore. Er, earlier. Yes, but not anymore. It's, it's kind of all panned out big yeah. picture stuff. Okay. A lot of people, you know, and we we did go through the Phil Schneider thing. A lot of people in the comment section will say, well, yeah, but how do you explain, you know, the, this ligature, this catheter around his neck? And, and it's, it's like there, there were certainly some suspicious components to his death. And by the way, I wanted to thank you for sending us his, his autopsy report. That's been helpful. Um, but having a catheter around your neck doesn't mean you got into an alien shootout. No, and there were some issues. Um, he had a home health care or a nurse or someone living with him. I can't remember her name. Off. I have to dig up a lot of this stuff I haven't looked at for a year or two. Sure. Um, so there was some questionable stuff about her involvement, may or may not be involved. Um, like I said, my dad talked to his brother. You know, we it's easy to get in this conspiracy. I get the conspiracy stuff because I look at all that stuff also. But to get a family member to conspire against, you know, falsifying time uh, reports or whatever the case, the coroner's office, and, and it can't happen. I'm not saying it do doesn't happen, but my dad looked at all that stuff. Uh, he had other people looking at that, not just him. 
that's a pretty major operation and it just never panned out and in some cases there's you know this day and age look on the news any given day there's people that commit a lot of crimes they falsify stuff yes that does happen but in phil's case um, it just never panned out and if people want to say oh well he what how do you explain this i'm not trying to explain how he died he died i told as i mentioned earlier they did a horrible investigation very sloppy investigation mm -hmm. but so i'm not there to investigate his how the death of him or how he died because i wasn't there and i can't go back and it's hard to go back into a crime scene and second guess what we're looking at is his involvement in the dulce story right right and that's so, what we're focusing on so we're, we don't focus on his murder his is like i mentioned they did the law enforcement did a horrible job on the, the investigation of his death but um we weren't looking at his death doing a homicide investigation so much as we were trying to verify his stories about dulce does that make sense a little Abs bit of sense? absolutely one of the big things going through our chat room right now that people would like us to to pivot to talk about and i i've really been looking forward to to getting into this sort of associated issue is the cattle mutilations. And, okay. and I know that you've been there and, and done that. What I'm, maybe we can start with, how do we get, how do we get to these cattle mutilations and what's really going on with the cattle mutilations? A, a short answer to a long story. Yeah. The government was creating vaccinations for a lot of it. It, evolved over the years so it started with radioactive um, fallout <coughs> excuse me mm -hmm. into germ warfare type testing and then it um, over the years evolved into uh, weapons development and uh, like I said that's all this that's a whole nother price show but um yeah I'm the sure early the early emulations they were finding um like the heart of the animal would be um so decomposed it was like peanut butter from there getting hit with high doses of radio radioactivity or radiation they're finding ion exchange resins so the, all the evidence they were finding in the early 70s had to do with radiation type sickness mm -hmm. um as you they moved on to the 80s they were starting to get in they were finding atropine in the cattle because there's always this kind of urban legend well they never found evidence they found plenty of evidence they were finding chemicals they were finding a anticoagulants mm. so Obviously, those don't come from outer space. Those come from the government. In this case, to kind of sum it up, because like I said, we're going down a rabbit hole here, but for sure, um, what they were doing is creating vaccinations for either germ warfare, or radiation, and in the the later mutilations, they were getting into organophosphate poisoning issues. Those type of vaccinations, um, they were finding these cattle when they'd skin them and do necropsies on them. Like in the 90s, we'd find that they were microwaved underneath the skin where they were hitting them with a high-powered weapon. Hmm. And you're going down another <laughs> kind of alley here, but um, that's the evolution of all these mutilations. And there's a lot of documentation that goes with that. Unfortunately, this is the, kind of the bad part is a lot of people don't really care about the cattle anymore unless you're a rancher. Right. Um, it kind of gets pushed to the side, but it's a very important part of the story. And I tell people, like, you should be upset that they were killing all these cattle because a lot of this stuff getting, was getting into the food stream, which is a, another part of this. <laughs> it kind sure of was. It sure was at the Gomez Ranch. I, I believe in your book, uh, some cows were found marked with some kind of a special glow under uh, a glow under like a black light. It's kind of, kind of pink, under, but, yeah. Ultraviolet light and um See, Howard Burgess was the retired scientist from Sandia Labs that my dad um, used to help him get all this scientific analysis because my dad was a police officer. He wasn't a scientist, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, so he's like, when the first mutilation happened, he's like, there's some strange things here going on here. We need to do some scientific uh, evidence collection so that we can document it. And that's what they did. So Howard's the one that actually came up with this idea. He's like, you know, they have to be marked because they're killing these animals in the middle of nowhere in some rugged country. And how are they finding them? So they were finding like they'd have waves. So they'd have three year old heifers that were being murdered or mutilated. And then it would change to like a five year old heifer. So, you know, the New Mexico, northern New Mexico is a lot of cattle country. They bring in 10,000 um, 
a head of Mexican steers, but these outside herds were never getting mutilations. It was always the local herds that had been established there for generations where these have been having several calves or whatever the case. Well, you know, so there's a good genetic history of these these cattle in the area. Um, but that's kind of a gist of it, of the stuff that he found. You're going to hear other stories. People are going to come up with their own, but that's... But, but that's where the it bottom. started. And yeah, because without getting into a lot of like nitty gritty stuff here, yeah, that's just of it of what, a lot of emulations. What was going on? Okay, well, I appreciate that. And um, again, you know, your father was the cattle mutilation investigator in an official capacity before people in ufology started getting into it. Is that we we had kind of opened up that way? So it's it's good to have a working knowledge. Um, I wonder. How how are they, this is, you know, again, sort of nuts and bolts kinds of questions. How are they shooting such high amounts of radiation and, and all these things at these cows and then supposedly just getting away with, without having, leaving any traces? Uh, now, not, not meaning like refuse, but meaning more like how are they physically getting away? Are they using some kind of advanced experimental aircraft? Um, you know, yes. Yeah. Well, you saw what the Osama bin Laden a lot of people say, well, we don't have this technology. We have secret helicopters. How did they land two helicopters in someone's backyard and half the people didn't even wake up? They even crashed one. So that technology is available. Um, uh, we're kind of jumping around. We are. But if, <laughs> if, if we want to go back to, um, let's go back to the Dulce story. Maybe this will help, sure. help you understand a little bit better. So when Paul was showing us all these different locations up at, let's be specific to Mount Archuleta, because that's where all this stuff's supposedly going on. Um, over the course of all these expeditions, we're going up there back and forth. We found a what looked like a ventilation shaft. Um, there's a basically a highway up there that someone put in there and it wasn't the tribe. And I mentioned the crash site earlier. So now we know they took the, the crashed aircraft out of there. Um, there's guard towers up there. What do you need guard towers? Up yeah, there what for? do you need guard towers for? Yeah. So while we were up there doing these expeditions, um, as I mentioned earlier, Paul had said that the aircraft was nuclear powered. So my dad got involved with uh, Senator Pete Domenici's office because they thought, well, maybe we have a, a nuke site up here where it's contaminated. So they had Geiger counters. They took Geiger counters up there just to make sure, because we did find the crash site. So we just want to make sure it's not radioactive or we're not right. exposing ourselves to anything weird because of all the strange things that were going on. Um, so to su kind of sum up this little story, while we were up on top of Mount Archuleta, we were just randomly taking pictures of the, um, the area one day. So just by dumb luck, remember this is 35 millimeter camera time frame. This isn't cell phones. <laughs> right, right. You got to so really plan to go, your shot. <laughs> well, yeah, we're just taking random photos. So we go back into town and um, we develop the film. So when we develop the film, we notice there's some type of aircraft in these photos. But we never saw them up there. We never heard them. We just, they just showed up in the films. Huh. So my dad had, a, he had, you know, this is New Mexico and he had some, he knew people at Los Alamos Labs. They blew up the photo of this aircraft and it has the pilot's name and it's American pilot has a little insignia and all this stuff in what was very evident and the kind of the light bulb went off. They're testing military advanced military aircraft. So you got to rewind. This is back in the early 80s. So in the early 80s, they had silent and invisible aircraft. The, the human eye couldn't pick it up, but the camera lens could for whatever reason. The, the camouflage system that it had. I'll be damned. Um, a lot of this stuff, like I said, if you go back now, it's declassified. They use uh, LCD and LED uh, cameras to project it onto the wings. And you can find some stuff on it if you know where to look, but it's old technology. So they've obviously replaced it. If they declassified it, something else has already <laughs> taken its place. Right. Do you remember the name of what, what there's a, uh those documents, you know, like a search string for what those projects or, or aircraft were, just out of curiosity? Well, some of this new, um, I believe it's the, what is it the Raptor? What, the Raptor. F-35 or F-22. Some of that is integrated in it. You're not going to find a ton of information on that because that aircraft's still classified. 
but um they use a the camera basically just shoots a, a picture of the the ground and projects it on the wingtips um some of the other stuff i had found is they were back in the 80s 90s they were using a type a specific type of paint to do a similar thing for its stealth stuff is all it is right and it's camouflage high-tech camouflage but so anyway that's kind of where the pieces of the puzzle started falling together where they were dulce was a military um testing facility for projects out of kirtland okay and so was there was there really an underground facility at either one of the two dual sea locations the Art, mount they, archuleta or from the evidence there appears that there's something underground up there now the seven levels and all that stuff that, there's never been any evidence of that there's never been any, any evidence of the tunnels okay but it looks like they were testing um the military aircraft and there's more stories to back that up more evidence to support that and like I said, it's just it's very time consuming, but the there was a lot of military activity out of Fort Carson, Colorado. Delta Force was training up there. Delta uh, Force. Yeah, they used to use that as a training facility. Um, one of the key things on these cattle is like the ranchers would check on these cattle. Like let's say they go out tonight and, and go see their, you know, cow 241 or whatever the ear tag has on it. So they come back out in the morning and they'd find that animal dead. So that animal was killed within an eight hour period. So that has to be someplace that was fairly close. They're not taking them to California, obviously, or Canada or wherever, just for the, the point of, of argument. of. So they knew that they were mutilating these cows somewhat, somewhere in the area, whether they had a, they were dropping them in trucks or taking them to a, a lab or even Los Alamos or Albuquerque for all we know. So, Getting into the Dulce story, the Redding Ranch was set up and they were pretty sure that's where they were taking a lot of these animals. Hmm. And that's where this base is supposed to be, which is the Redding Ranch. And it's actually in Colorado. It's on the north end of the Hickory Reservation. And the that's Redding where Ranch. all the, okay. but to keep in mind, the person that gave them all this information was Richard Doty. And it no. came from him. So this is the classified stuff. He leaked a lot of, of very good information. If you know how to read it and you know what you're looking for, he gave a lot of accurate stuff and then he'd mix in some other misinformation. But to convince Paul of all the, the story he was trying to tell him, he had to give him some partial truths and that's part of the partial truths. And he actually, you know, he, he probably made a huge mistake. That might have, I don't know the details, but his career ended with the Air Force. And it's always been a, a, a suspicion. That's probably the reason his career, one of the main reasons his career didn't go as far is because he class, he gave a lot of classified information. No one had ever known about the Dulce base if it wasn't for him. <laughs> but there are, there are evidence, uh, there is evidence of, like I mentioned, the guard towers, the ventilation shafts, um, there's tailing piles where it looks like stuff's been bored into the mountains. But as far as the alien stuff, there's never been any evidence of that. Right. And so what kinds of things are, are would you say, are, are going on there now? I mean, I'm, I'm to assume that, that the Fort Carson connection is probably still active. And having spent so much time in the area, you know, engaged in investigations yourself as well as your father, do you have any read on what, what the activity levels are there now and what's actually still happening? Well, I still talk to locals and they see lights every once in a while, but it's nothing near like the, the levels that we were having in the 80s and 70s because it was so common. We could go out almost on any given night and you could set your watch at 10 o'clock. These lights would come out and they chase them all over the reservation. And my dad would I'd go with them. And, you know, they, like I mentioned earlier, people would come up and at 10 o'clock. It's like, well, we'll go look and see if we see the lights. And almost most of the time we would see them, you know, they were they were that common that they were testing them wow another thing that my dad um one night they were playing playing cat and mouse with one of these lights and <laughs> it's just for people that know northern new mexico it's it's kind of like the wild west uh, they were going to shoot it out of the sky so they were trying to corner one of the lights the game and fish officers the tribal game and fish and the tribal uh, police and my dad we're chasing these lights around the reservation with, you know, they're on dirt roads with no lights on in the middle of the night and um, trying to get as close to this light. The light's kind of playing with them. 
Huh. So they would say, they get on the radio and they'd say, well, it's over here at this ridge top or, or whatever the case, and the light would go off and they wouldn't find it. So my dad told them, start talking in Apache, don't talk in English anymore, because he knew enough Apache to get by. Yeah. And when they did that, they were able to corner one. So that was another big indicator. And this happened early when they were messing with the cattle and all the lights and some of the adventures that were going on in Dulce. He goes, he knew that, well, these guys speak English. Who's ever flying these aircraft? But for some reason, they don't speak Apache. So that's a pretty good indication. This is probably, you know, going to be a military or a testing thing. Oh, yeah. Well, because then if you follow that logic, then if it were aliens, if it weren't humans, then then they would certainly have the technology to decode Apache, but they couldn't. Or, yeah. or telepathic or whatever, you know. Right. It's whatever people. But for him as a just a little, I'm not sure yet. I'm still trying to figure this out. That was a big indicator. It's like, well, they're, they're monitoring our radio traffic. So it's someone that speaks English. <laughs> they at least knew they spoke English and they didn't know Apache. So to him, it was just one of those little things. You know, you add all these different slides as you're seeing all this information come in and you build these uh, slides over the years and then you add it up when you see the big picture of the investigation. Um, but that's one of those little things where um, he just he paid attention to it and down the road it made more sense. At the time it didn't make any sense, but, you know, as, it, as time progressed and he, he gathered more information, that's kind of what the... The, the evidence pointed to, or that's what the evidence didn't point to. I think that that's an important part in conducting an investigation is sometimes you're, you're gathering data and you're not really sure what it means, but you kind of follow it away. And then some, some ways down the road, you come across something, something else. And you're like, wait a minute. I, I remember that document. I, I, I saw that in a document or I saw that in, in a report. And so, you know, some of the frustrating components of investigations, um, I'm sure you've experienced yourself is just, yeah, these things take time, and they're it's boring to wait for requests to come back. Yeah, and it, that's just part of it. it. So you have to kind of make three categories. You know what it is, you don't know what it is, and, or you're in the middle and we'll wait and figure that out later because like, it takes more information. You don't ignore it or, or throw it to, in the trash, but you just have to you know keep on it and maybe come back to it five years, 20 years later. And then, and that's a lot of this case. Now you, you go back and revisit a lot of this stuff 20 years and it, it just, all the puzzle pieces fall into place. But um, I know what I'm looking for. It's easy for me because I know the story and I've been involved with all these people. So for me, it's really easy to, to find what I'm looking for or find the, the information or the evidence. But if people aren't familiar with the story, first of all, they're chasing a rabbit. And, you know, if, if they don't even know where the, the real story started or it just wastes time is basically all you're doing when you can be be more productive looking for other stuff. And for me, I think it's interesting. Um, some people think it's boring because it's not what they're looking for, but the story is the story and that's where it takes you. And I still think it's interesting. But, oh, it's um, fascinating. I've, I get that a lot of people who are like, well, that's not exciting. I was like, Sometimes investigating stuff is not exciting. It's monotonous <laughs> and boring, but. Yeah, I, I, I kind of have the investigation bug. It's like, you know, you get those new documents back and it's like, oh, you know, let's see what they say. It's kind of it's kind of like a little bit of a treasure hunt. Um, as we're winding down uh, tonight, Greg, and I really appreciate you you coming up. Uh, we just have a couple more questions from the from the uh, chat room uh, that have been accumulating over the course of today's show. So this kind of like more Q&A kinds of things. Um, do you have any thoughts or comments on William Cooper? Yeah, my dad actually, I talked to him a couple times. Um, like I said, I, I don't throw out all the con conspiracy stuff. There's bits and pieces of truth to it. Um, I don't necessarily follow all it. I pay attention to it, though, because we just talked about it. You have to take all this information in, whether you take a side or, or just kind of sit on it for a while. So some of the stuff he had was was pretty accurate. Of course, some of it was was a little bit off, but... Um, um, he was up and I, he talked to my dad quite a bit there for a while. And that was, that's been quite a, probably we're looking at decades ago since that happened. But um, so some of the stuff he had was legitimate. And when we look at this, like me and my dad, we were looking a lot at the Dulce stuff. Um, he was getting stuff from all over the world, um, but he was focusing more on how to pertain to Dulce. So uh, Cooper kind of went in another direction. 
-hmm. and we followed it but it's one of those we got enough work over here we need to <laughs> do pay attention to what we're doing you know we gotta we gotta kind of narrow it down what do you think the future of this field is is going to be i mean you've been in this field for quite some time um, it's, I mean, it's already tied to a lot of lore and stories and, and there's modern experiencers getting involved. Um, do you think that, that what's really going on will ever truly know? Well, some people will figure it out. Um, but I don't think it, it, <laughs> it's a long story, but anytime you talk about people, 